Hi there, and welcome to the Explaining History podcast. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the Young Turks Revolt of 1908 and the overthrow of the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Abdul Hamid II. By the end of the 19th century, uh, the European dominance of Asia presented such a profound and existential challenge to not just the colonised countries of Asia, but those which hadn't been fully colonised and yet were becoming increasingly economically um, colonised, or at least drawn into the economic uh, models that had been created by uh, fair, uh, free trade and economic liberalism uh, from Western Europe, or had been drawn into the world of the the financial world that Europe be, Europe had created principally through debt. If you look at Persia, if you look at Egypt, if you look at the Ottoman Empire, of which uh, Egypt is a semi-autonomous part, each of these faces immense crises due to debt, the uh, borrowing from European banks and the restructuring of the economy uh, as a result. It's very similar to the structural adjustment programmes that the IMF imposed on uh, Asia and Africa in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. Uh, in essence, if you borrow from us, then you must cut your cloth accordingly and stop spending on important things. In the case of the Ottoman Empire, the thing that would absolutely proved to be the end of Abdul Hamid was uh, military spending, but we're going to come to that in a moment. It's interesting that you have a revolution in the, um, in the Ottoman Empire in 1908, a similar revolution in, the, in China against the Qing dynasty in 1911, and a revolution with certain similarities though obviously under the conditions of world war, in Russia in February 1917. These uh, immense Asiatic autocratic empires all faced uh, insuperable crises. And there were at the same time European empires that managed to weather the storms far more effectively. In one way it might be possible to argue that one of the benefits of liberal democracy to countries like Great Britain is that they enabled um, equally vast imperial systems to operate in a more durable fashion and to survive their autocratic counterparts by half a century or so. I'm not sure there's a full history of the revolutions that sweep away the uh, Ottoman, the Qing and the Romanov dynasties, has been uh, created yet, but one of the things that comes close to it is Pankaj Mishra's From the Ruins of Empire, uh, which uh, really is a a very interesting and thoughtful account of the challenge that European hegemony poses to Asia and the responses. However, the two books that I'm going to look at today are Ottoman Endgame by Sean McMeekin and Shattering Empires by Michael Reynolds, a Cambridge University Press publication, and one of the best accounts of the war, uh, or the wars between the Ottoman and Russian empires, 1908 to 1918. The Ottoman Empire had been experiencing a long period of reform as a result of its progressive decline from the 1830s through to 1876. In 1876, a two-year period, uh, known as the First Constitutional Era, uh, was instituted when um, Sultan Abdul Aziz was dethroned and in his place Abdul Hamid II was um, replaced as Sultan. This period of time coincides with the Russo-Turkish War over Bulgaria. Um, I'm pretty sure I've done something on the Eastern Question and the Russo-Turkish War before. You can look back to the archive and find it. Um, The problem that the reform-minded Turks uh, encountered was Abdul Hamid himself. Abdul Hamid had a two-year period where he allowed the first Ottoman constitution, uh, created in 1876, uh, to last. 
after that, he realised that the, or it was plainly plain to see, that modernisation in Turkey was leading to a progressive increase in uh, Western penetration of Turkish society and the economy. And the uh, and Abdul Hamid at that point uh, re- suspended the constitution and returned to direct autocratic rule. Under his rule, he didn't stop being a modernizer, but as with all autocratic modernizers, the refusal to modernize the political system to liberalize uh, along, but at the same time attempting to uh, economically and socially modernise, brought about irreconcilable tensions in the empire. Uh, An an analogous figure might be seen as Alexander II in Russia, who attempted to bring about limited uh, social and economic reforms. Indeed, the attempt to end serfdom in Russia, which simply backfires by landing the serfs, the newly emancipated serfs, with vast debts, and the refusal to bring about any uh, con- meaningful constitutional reform and to uh, allow other groups, such as the emergent bourgeoisie in Russia, a say in society, simply created a, a large revolutionary movement against him and a class of young, disgruntled, but highly educated people that were dedicated to waging their own private war on the autocracy. The development of railway in Romelia and Anatolia, and the planned Berlin-Baghdad railway, and even the Hejaz railway uh, deep into the Arabian Peninsula, were all um, pet projects of Abdul Hamid, who understood the relationship between rail modernity and the holding together of a disparate and fissile empire with a very wide and eclectic range of subjects from uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Arabs, Armenians, Turks, Greeks, uh, Balkan, uh, Slavs, Romanians, Magyars and others. The main body of opposition in the empire was the Committee of Union and Progress, an organisation made up of initially medical students but disgruntled um, members of the aristocracy and um, army officers also became significant CUP members. The CUP was initially a liberal reform movement and its stated goal was to return the Ottoman Empire to the status of great power. The Meiji Restoration in Japan uh, that had led to rapid modernisation of Japan had drawn inspiration from the CUP, and there were all manner of uh, interesting delegations between Japan and the Ottoman Empire in the 1880s and 1890s, where ideas were passed back and forth about modernising in order to uh, prevent, present a challenge to uh, European hegemony and also to prevent uh, either power from becoming victims of it. Ottoman administrators looked on with concern at Britain's occupation in India and the Japanese were not blind to the fact had it not been for their uh, efforts to modernise and build an effective military and war industry, that they would probably have gone the same way as China and have all manner of treaty ports dotted up and down the coast and extraterritoriality, meaning uh, exemption from Chinese rule um, for Western uh, Western missionaries and uh, traders and mercenaries uh, drifting across China. Abdul Hamid was surprisingly lenient with dissenting figures. Uh, The opponents, the members of the CUP who actively opposed him and who were sent into exile were sent into fairly comfortable European exile. Again, there's an interesting comparison with Russia here. When you look at the standards of exile that people like Trotsky had to endure in Siberia, they're relatively comfortable. 
when he is sent into Siberian exile, he's allowed to take a library of books with him on the train. Uh, far, far more um, comfortable than uh, anything that Stalinism offered those that were sent to the gulags, for example. The leading lights of the CUP who were exiled in within the Ottoman Empire often had to serve out their harshest exile in Libya, but it was more likely that they would be simply banished to Europe, where they had to uh, suffer exile in places like Geneva or Paris, and many of them were able to take large uh, amounts of wealth with them uh, and lived on the uh, high life of the early 20th century European bourgeoisie. They were a kind of an, an exotic addition to this uh, Middle Europa that you, you see uh, documented by people like Stefan Zweig, for example. Now, in 1876, uh, following the Treaty of San Stefano, where Russia managed to uh, extract from uh, the Ottoman Empire a large Bulgarian state, which it hoped to manage, and which was quickly uh, over overruled at the Congress of Berlin by Bismarck, uh, along with the Austrians and the British, who had no intention of seeing uh, Russia become so dominant in the Balkans. Clauses were attached in the Treaty of Berlin that meant that, their, that the Ottoman Empire was almost legally obliged to introduce reforms, uh, political and institutional, bureaucratic and economic reforms, to uh, modernise it as a, as a country. It presented the uh, British particularly with all sorts of opportunities to extract wealth from the Ottoman Empire. Nobody was doing the Ottomans a favour at all. But the Young Turk, the, the CUP, uh, present, looked to these clauses and essentially appealed to European powers to intervene in the Ottoman Empire as the Ottoman Empire was essentially through uh, not meeting in its entirety the regulations stipulated in the uh, treaty at the end of the Congress of Berlin. More nationalist-minded members of the CUP avoided this line of argument uh, with a, uh, a vengeance. They didn't want their membership to think that what they were really encouraging was a, a Franco-British or germano uh, British uh, carve-up of the Ottoman Empire, which is in essence what they were encouraging. Instead, one of the most significant revolutionary figures of the era, Ahmed Riza, who would later become the first president of the new Chamber of Deputies after 1908, encouraged members of the CUP to promise uh, to uphold the inviolability of the Ottoman Empire, that if the Ottoman Empire was going to be reformed, it could not be dismembered. And an entire the whole point of reforming the empire is that it stays together and that the uh, a non-reformed empire was likely to fragment. And one of the great questions that faced the CUP and progressive reformers is what would the status of Muslim and non-Muslim people be within a reformed Ottoman Empire. Obviously, up until 1908, Muslims had been uh, f first-class citizens. The manner in which non-Muslim people were treated ranged from the Bulgarian atrocities, where the Bashi Bazouks, the uh, real mercenaries of the uh, Ottoman armies, uh, went on the rampage, to the fact that in uh, the Christians in places such as Syria or Jews in Palestine were allowed to exercise most of their rights of citizenship but paid higher taxes and were you know treated essentially reasonably reasonably well but had a, a slightly inferior status to that of Ottoman Muslims. Riza suggested that the um, primacy that Muslims enjoyed in the Ottoman Empire would be symbolic, um, that there would be have to be some kind of reform um, to establish 
more equal rights between uh, Muslims and non-Muslims. And while uh, Abdul Hamid II was not particularly phased by these external exiles, mainly uh, debating uh, points of order between themselves in Paris, his uh, threat, the threat to him was never really going to come from the, uh, the, the revolutionary groups uh, overseas. Instead, the main threat to him comes from the army. And this is because the reform era and the, the Tanzimat reform era and the encroaching um, financialization of the Ottoman Empire by Western European powers meant that there were significant cuts to uh, army and navy budgets and significant cuts were made in order to service loans back to uh, British and French and German banks. Heavy spending on things such as the Berlin-Baghdad Railway, for example, um, had meant that the Ottoman uh, government was uh, quite heavily indebted. So what results is you have uh, a, an army that occupies a large parts of um, the empire uh, that is a device for a kind of a glue for holding the empire together but at the same time feels desperately inferior when it rubs shoulders with foreign counterparts, such as uh, British or German or French uh, soldiers, whom they meet quite frequently in places such as Bulgaria, which since the Congress of Berlin had a special autonomous status. And there were all manner of European military observers, military attaches, and representatives of the European great powers uh, were found frequently uh, in Bulgaria, in 1903, in Macedonia, an uprising occurred and the great powers of Austria and Russia seized upon the unrest. The Turks put the uh, uprising down with a considerable amount of violence, but the Turkish army believed they had uh, done a job well done and had managed to effectively police their own territory. Pressure from Russia and Austria, along with the other great powers of Europe, meant that the Turks were forced to accept an international gendarmerie within Macedonia to keep the peace, and this was deeply resented by Turkish soldiers, once again, who had to feel that they were the inferior cousins of the French, the British, the Austrians and Italians uh, who were stationed there. In 1906, during further austerity belt tightening, the Ottoman army actually go unpaid for a month. By 1908, the army contained a wide number, a widespread number of hidden cells of conspirators against um, Abdul Hamid, and these operated in a standard terrorist protocol of members only knowing a handful of their compatriots. They were initiated in a ritual, a blindfold ritual, where they were forced to swear on a sword and the Koran to be willing to fight and to uh, be killed in the cause of an uprising. And there were no shortage of recruits. And they liked Ahmed Reza's um, ideas. Ahmed Reza was one of the inspirations for Mustafa Kemal, or later Kemal Ataturk, who I'm really looking forward to talking about in much greater depth um, as, we, uh, as we move on through this topic, uh, perhaps in a, a couple of weeks' time. The idea of allowing Europeans to meddle in the affairs of the Ottoman Empire obviously was far less uh, attractive. The army cells that had originally uh, loosely known themselves as the, Ottoman, as the Ottoman Freedom Society rebranded themselves in September 1907 as the Committee of Union and Progress, taking Ahmed Reza's uh, title and really initiating a kind of a merger between the two. The security of the CUP was so poor that the uh, agents of um, Abdul Hamid were well aware of what was being planned. And the ally of the Sultan uh, Germany, uh, the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who had uh, pioneered the Berlin-Baghdad Railway 
and had claimed himself the uh, friend to all Muslims, uh, was able to write quite detailed accounts to Abdul Hamid, um, suggesting that really he might have some trouble on his hands. In the spring of 1908, when um, the uh, King Edward VII of Britain and Nicholas II of Russia uh, met in the Baltic states, they, uh, it was rumoured that the pair of them who were about to um, consolidate their agreement of the previous year, the Anglo-Russian Accord of 1907, um, by divvying up spheres of influence, one of those spheres of influence it was thought would be a significant part of the Ottoman Empire, specifically Macedonia. The Russian fleet was uh, conducting uh, menacing um, naval manoeuvres along the Black Sea coast of Turkey. And the way the CUP saw this was that there was limited time in which for them to act to remove a weakened ruler who could only bend the knee to Europeans and to replace that ruler with a uh, liberal nationalist uh, government that would fight for the Ottoman Empire, stand up for it, and prevent its disintegration. And that had to come from the CUP. In June and July 1908, a wave of assassinations of um, Abdul Hamid's uh, p police chiefs and uh, army officers ended with the killing of General Semsi Pasha, who was sent to uh, crush uh, any mutiny in the Third Army, which was stationed in Macedonia, and he was uh, gunned down in broad daylight uh, by a CUP officer. The uh, troops that were sent from Anatolia in Turkey to uh, finish the job, to crush the uprising, simply went over to the side of their compatriots, showing really the extent to which Abdul Hamid had lost control of the army. The C um, CUP committees within army regiments demanded the reinstatement of the constitution of 17, uh, 1876, and they actually are as bold as to send their messages direct to Abdul Hamid at the Yildiz Palace uh, in um, Istanbul himself. Abdul Hamid was um, nothing if not shrewd, and on the night of July the 23rd, he invoked the constitution, he recalled parliament, and he uh, issued imperial decrees abolishing the secret police, prerogatives, um, and its prerogatives for search and seizures. He uh, eliminated uh, preemptive censorship, and he uh, required the publishing of an annual um, governmental budget, the special tribunals that were set up in Macedonia to uh, stop the CUP were ended, and there was an amnesty for political prisoners. And the CUP revolution had pushed Abdul Hamid without any violence, well, not much violence anyway, uh, into uh, endorsing its values. But in a way, this was the um, politics of a clever political operator who had really simply in stolen the thunder of revolutionaries and saved himself as a result. There's a very telling comment by Sean McMeekin here, and he says, It is important to recall the sequence of events in summer 1908 precisely, because they were so badly misunderstood outside the country. European journalists most, uh, mostly noticed the euphoric, multi-ethnic crowds chanting French revolutionary slogans, Egalité, Liberté, Justice, Fraternité. And yet these crowns did not materialise until after the Sultan had announced the recall of Parliament. They cannot have played any role in driving events. Until Abdul Hamid's preemptive move, no one in the capital, nor anywhere else in the empire outside Macedonia, had the slightest idea that any kind of revolution was afoot. Nor were most people clear on what exactly was meant by the reinstatement of the constitution. So we're going to continue um, throughout the next few weeks looking at the gradual decline of the Ottoman Empire from the start of the 20th century onwards. 
and the various wars and successor states that emerge and the impact of the First World War. So I hope you find that interesting and useful. Um, do, if you can, give us a good thumbs up on the iTunes page um, and if you can visit our Patreon site, that would be great. And I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. All the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>